here we are on a beautiful March 27th, deep, <laughs> what, two weeks? I've probably not really been out of the house in two weeks um, <laughs> because of this whole thing. I caught it. I survived. Um, it was Confirmed gnarly. Positive. Uh, they don't have enough tests, um, but it was a really unique sickness where I just didn't feel, it didn't feel like a normal cold or flu. And I certainly was coughing like a lunatic, yeah. um, which is not normal for me. And my girlfriend caught it and can't taste or smell anything. Oh yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's is almost as good <laughs> as a positive test. It seems good enough like. for me. So I'm pretty sure we both have it. And thankfully we're just in lockdown. Um, we're able to make it work somehow. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, welcome, Madeline from Leadville. Very cool. Oh, very cool. Um, so to get started, Mitch Gomez, you are the executive director of Dance Safe, and yeah. you're a peer-based harm reduction organization trying to teach people just the basics of harm reduction and implementing tools for sale. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I sort of view our mission as a little bit more expansive than that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly sort of the original mission was, you know, peer based harm reduction. Uh, I really think that the way we should think about harm reduction is not just like the things we do to keep everyone alive, mm -hmm. uh, but what we're actually trying to do is develop alternative models to prohibition, right? So, so much of what we do is directly created by drug prohibition that, like, not thinking about that, not sort of pushing that message, not developing you know, that language to talk about it, uh, I think would do a disservice to, to the movement. Uh, but that's, a, a, yes, that's, that's sort of the larger uh, answer. Yeah. Uh, in, ter in terms of like practical day-to-day, -day, like what we do with our time, uh, yeah, we're basically just trying to make sure that uh, everybody can, you know, be as safe as possible when they're making their decisions about both substance use and also just, you know, other things that come up within the festival scene as well. Um, you know, in terms of like physical space in my basement, certainly the condoms take up way more room than anything else, right? And so that's not, you know, unique to substance use at all. Uh, but anything within the scene that, you know, we can sort of provide harm reduction services around, uh, we try to do that. And then also educate people so that they can keep their own peer groups uh, as safe as possible. Absolutely, great. Yeah, it's, um, I recall one of the first times I saw a full dance safe kind of tent set up somewhere the, the most notable things were the condoms and the earplugs. Yeah. Um, people abuse their eardrums like crazy. I, yeah. As, as, some, have as you know, a normal human hearing range is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Uh, my left ear is like uh, 80 to 14,000. So I'm like massively mm. clipped on both sides mm. uh, and just basically don't hear. Like if there's running water, I'm like functionally deaf on the left side of my because oh that's the God. range I have is the range where falling water hits. Uh, <laughs> and so if there's run, if like there's a sink running, I'm like functionally deaf on the left side. So because of the race scene, I mean, I was, I was in the scene very, very young and mm -hmm. uh, have really spent a, a large portion of my life, like in the, in the scene. Yeah. I'm, I'm starting to learn. Thankfully I got a late start with live music and <laughs> I might have permanent tinnitus, but at least I'm getting ahead of it. Um, okay. Yeah. So, Huge situation happening globally, coronavirus. Um, drug users are impacted on multiple levels. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of possible new harms and um, just potential harms that are now potentiated. Um, so I guess to, to kick it off, how generally can drug users prevent the spread of infectious disease? You know, generally, including this virus, like this is obviously a special virus in a sense, but you know, there's still hepatitis out there and plenty of yeah. other crazy stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's a that's a broad question, which is good, because yeah. uh, I can talk about things for a long time. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think that the sort of biggest answer is that we really should all be listening to social distancing right now. Uh, this virus is unique in the sense that, you know, if you're within 10 or 12 feet of somebody uh, and they happen to cough while you're around them, it seems pretty virulent. Like there's the, the spread is, is happening very, very quickly. Uh, and so I think the really taking that seriously, even as like our age demographic uh, is, is step one. I think that we really should be focusing on staying home uh, as much as possible, avoiding social interaction as much as possible, not social interaction, physical interaction, right? Like there's lots of ways to have social interaction. <laughs> that 
require being physically close to someone. Um, we're actually really lucky in the sense that like we have this technology during this pandemic. You know, the idea of like social distancing 50 years ago, uh, I don't know how that would have worked. I, like I literally don't know how that would have worked, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, in terms of substance use specifically, uh, there's some unique dangers now. And I think that broadly we can, you know, categorize them in two sort of big, big uh, categories. Uh, the first being that, you know, if you're consuming drugs right now, you're introducing a substance into your body. And if the virus is on that substance, you're going to get it, right? right. Like that's, your nasal passages are a really, really good way to like introduce viruses into your, into your body. It bypasses your lymphatic system. If you're snorting substances, if you're insufflating things, um, that's actually why it's such an effective uh, route of administration. Like that's why it's such a common one is that it hits you really quickly, right? I mean, that's, that's the point. Uh, mm -hmm. But if there's, you know, viruses on that surface, and so there've been some really good guides that've been put out about, you know, you want to make sure to clean the surfaces that you're using on, uh, you know, use individual snorting implements, which should always be the protocol. Like you never want to be sharing uh, snorting implements with anybody that you're not like basically, you know, sexually fluid bonded with. Uh, if it's a person you regularly have unprotected sex with, there's no additional risk uh, that's known for using snorting implements. But if right. it's not somebody that you're on that level of intimacy with, uh, you know, you should have your own snorting implements. And I think they started selling some straws recently. Yeah, I might actually have one. Yeah, so hold on. I think I recall you saying this is one of the most controversial offerings. Yeah, certainly uh, not not controversial. <laughs> yes, these are uh, yeah. Chris tubes. They're sort of individual uh, snorting implements uh, that, oh, I just got to notice that my internet connection is unstable. So if I vanish, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, they, they fit on necklaces, uh, very, very easy to carry around. Um, I think pretty discreet. They don't, you know, I tend to wear a lot of necklaces and like on my pile of necklaces, they don't really stand out. Uh, you know, you certainly want to make sure to wash, you certainly want to make sure to wash them. You certainly want to make sure to, you know, keep them clean if you're going through security or an airport or something. Uh, but yeah, they're great little, uh, great little tools. Um, you know, we've had the safer snorting cards for years now. Uh, for a long time, DanceSafe was giving out cut straws at events. Uh, and I will tell you, a bowl of blacklight reactive straws cut about this big, really an attention getter at a festival, right? I mean, it really, everybody notices from the promoter to the patrons, the law, you know, everybody notices the bowl of cut straws. Uh, and we did, we got a lot of pushback on that uh, throughout the years. We had a lot of promoters who would not be comfortable with us offering that. So we started printing uh, organic hemp, organic ink, perforated business cards, uh, which have you know hepatitis information on them. Uh, hepatitis is sort of the main known risk for sharing snorting implements. Uh, there are many, many documented cases of people spreading hepatitis where they didn't have sex with somebody who was, they know they got it through encephalation. So we know it's a known transmission uh, for, uh, for that one. Uh, and so we've, we've been giving out those cards for a while, but they're incredibly expensive to produce. They're about 25 cents a card. Uh, you know, we're ordering them 10,000 at a time and giving them out. They're quite expensive. Uh, these straws were actually a, a product that somebody brought to us. They said, hey, I have this medical grade aluminum product that I want to bring to market. I want to brand it with DanceSafe. And, and we thought it was a great idea. Um, I knew we were going to get pushback. Uh, but the reality is this is core harm reduction, right? The idea of giving out safe implements uh, you know, sort of really ties in with needle exchanges, which have been, you know, are now funded by state and county governments all over this country. It's not a particularly controversial idea anymore that people who are consuming substances should have access to like clean, uh, you know, you know, individual use uh, consumption implements. Mm. Uh, and, and hepatitis is kind of a kind of a pain. Like if you, if you get hep C, it's, it's, there is a cure, but it's like $10,000. Uh, and so, yeah, it's important to avoid, uh, avoid doing that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's, um, it's certainly, we've had a few comments in here. Uh, Rick says that maps need some straws. Yeah. Happy <laughs> and, to make uh, that intro. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Jim says he uses post-it notes, you know, single use, like I'm sure it's not totally antiviral, but it's certainly better than sharing a $30 sure. bill or something. And, and dollar bills are, are. I mean, really like filthy, just like, like physiological, like physically, they're physically dirty things, right? Like people handle them all the time. They get pressed in sorting machines. 
uh, and your nose is a bodily orifice with a mucous membrane. Like you need to treat your nose like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and often at festivals, you know, I'll be walking through campgrounds and see people sharing a baggie with a key. You know, there's a baggie going around with a key. Uh, and like, I just can't walk by that and not say something. I'm just incapable of doing that. So I'll often stop and be like, Hey, like Mitchell from Dan safe. Wanted to let you guys know that like, you know, your nose is a bodily orifice with a mucous membrane. You should not be sharing a key. Like basically if you wouldn't have unprotected sex with someone, you should not be sharing a key with them. Mm. Uh, every time I say that there's like one person in the circle that everybody looks at. It's like that one person that none of them would have unprotected sex with, you know, um, there's, there's always one. It's, it's never, it never fails. That always happens. Uh, classic. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, you need to think of your nose that way, but we don't, we don't think mm. of it that way. Um, which is another one that, uh, 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 I think that I saw Rick's comment too and lost it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. um, but no, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, this is another sort of failure of our drug education system where we're so focused on prohibition only messaging, just say no, don't do drugs. Um, it would be very, very easy to message this like along with condom use, right? Like we teach middle schoolers about condoms. We, there is absolutely no reason that you couldn't just include this sort of messaging, you know, giving them condoms does not say you should be having sex and teaching them that they shouldn't be putting things up their nose does not encourage them to use drugs. This is just teaching them how to be safe if they make these choices. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And you know, we live on a planet, we live in a country now where even in like government surveys, which I think are massively under reporting substance use, more than 50% of people now say they've used an illegal drug at some point in their life. Mm. Uh, and so it's just like by definition of the word, drug use is normal. Like that's what normal means, right? Is that most people have done it. Uh, and so if we live in a world where most people have used drugs, we need to be educating just as heavily on harm reduction as we do on uh, safer sex. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, I, but, but what I was gonna say, the, the, you know, avoiding the virus is one part of this conversation. Right. Um, I think the other part that has not been getting much press that we haven't been talking about, that we haven't been thinking about yet is that our hospital systems are about to be really, really overwhelmed. I mean, we are a few mm -hmm. days out. Uh, all of my friends who work in the medical field all have been comparing it to like being at Winterfell where you're waiting for the White Walkers, right? Like, kind of, yeah. Supplies are there, everybody's getting ready. Uh, like things are about to get very, very serious. Yeah. Uh, and adverse medical incidents resulting from substance use that historically would have been very easy to deal with, right? You go to the hospital, they deal with whatever's wrong, you go home. Uh, we're gonna have a time period here for a few weeks or a few months, however long it takes for this situation to normalize where those sorts of medical incidents might kill you. Um, they might be fatal. Uh, and so really anybody who's using substances at this point that they didn't source from a doctor, uh, that you know they didn't uh, create themselves, which is obviously a very small subcategory of substance <laughs> users, uh, but anyone using anything sourced through the black market needs to be aware that, you know, misrepresentation, uh, fentanyl adulteration, like these things might kill you now. Whereas, you know, maybe a few weeks ago, they would not have done that. Uh, and so really anyone who uses anything needs to be testing it every time. They need to have Narcan on hand, even if they're not using opiates. Uh, you know, a milligram of fentanyl in your cocaine right now is not going to be a just go to the hospital and they Narcan you and, you know, they, it's not going to be like that. Uh, and so, yeah, like I have, I have a project I've been waiting to do that requires some power tools and like, I've put it on hold. I don't want to be messing with a bandsaw in my yard right now, uh, mm -hmm. because you know, the bandsaw breaks and hits you and like, it's a different situation right now. And so we really totally. all need to be thinking about ways to like minimize the potential of ending up in a situation where you need an emergency room, whether that's substance use related or, or not. Right. So realistically, I've, I've been kind of suggesting people just stop using drugs for at least a few weeks, um, roughly speaking. Because, you know, I think that's, yeah. that's always the safest choice, right, is to like not use substances. I think that's and, and I think it's fine as harm reductionists to say that, right, that the only way to be perfectly safe about these things is to not do them. Um, that's yeah. always true. It's particularly important now uh, when we're you know, if you think about uh, sort of the definitions that have historically been used for the third world or the global south, one of the big sort of categories of that is lack of access to emergency medical care, right? That's one of the big sort of defining characteristics of living in what used to be called a third world country. 
we are about to experience that as a nation in a way that like most Americans have never experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really a different thing when you're, I mean, I've lived in a bunch of countries like that. I, I traveled really compulsively for a long time. Uh, and you just, you can be fine. You can do all the things you want to do in those countries, but you have to also know that like, if you hurt yourself, it's on you as a community or an individual uh, to be able to deal with those, those risks. Uh, you're not picking up a phone and calling 911 and an ambulance is going to come get you and patch you up and take care of you. That's not how it is for most of the world. Uh, and we're about to enter a period of time where that's not what it's going to be in the United States. And it's going to be a real culture shock, I think, for a lot of people. Um, mm. It's going to take a long time to figure out what this looked like in retrospect, right? It's going to take a long time to sort mm. through medical records, to like sort through the data, to figure out what's happening. Um, I suspect we're going to see a non-trivial number of deaths that are not directly attributed to COVID-19, but occurred because of the overwhelmed hospital systems. Um, thousands, potentially, of deaths. Tens of thousands is like not outside of the realm of possibility. Um, and so what do we even call those, right? Are those gonna get classed as COVID-19 deaths? Like they probably should, <laughs> I mean, realistically. Yeah, like somehow, like indirect COVID deaths or something. Indirect COVID deaths, I think yeah. is a category we're going to need to look at, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you get into a car accident and crush your lung, you know, you crush your, break your ribs and damage your lungs. Uh, that was very unlikely to be a fatal incident like three weeks ago. Mm. Uh, over the next three weeks, like there's a lot of reasons not to be driving right now, not the least of which is nothing's open. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense to start thinking about the United States as functionally a third world nation in terms of medical services for the next few weeks, which is really frightening for a lot of people. Um, I'm just sort of going to pretend that I'm back in India. <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, don't, don't get in front of, you know, just be hyper aware of your surroundings. Mm -hmm. You know, anyone who's been to Burning Man is really good at this. Like, you know, there are medical services there, but they're not great. If it's serious, you're going to be on a $20,000 helicopter ride or $50,000 helicopter ride. Uh, and so like, you just sort of have to be hyper aware of like the dangers around you and how to mitigate them. And you know, if you don't have a first aid kit, this is a pretty good time to get one. Uh, you know, if you've never read, uh, like a wilderness survival guide, you know, there's some really good ones out there that are like 20 pages. They're easy to read. Uh, I'm not saying everyone needs to go get, you know, wilderness first aid responder certified, but there's a reason that I am. Um, like there's a reason that I did that is because I pretty regularly put myself in situations where I'm far away from medical services. Uh, yeah. but now I have to treat my house that way, <laughs> right? right? Which is new. I mean, that's new that sitting at home, you have to think of what's happening around you. And for substance use in particular, there are real risks to substance use. Um, you know, sort of the grand irony of Dansafe is that prohibitionists accuse us of being, uh, you know, uh, uh, encouraging substance use. Uh, and then on the other side, I have a lot of festy kids who, you know, will accuse me of like overstating dangers of substance use, right? They're like, no, acid's fine. Like you can give acid to anyone, like it doesn't matter. And it's like, no, like if you have a family history of, of schizophrenia, taking strong psychedelics is probably not a great idea. You need to be aware that there is a real risk there that's a potential risk. It's not everyone. People, mm -hmm. I know people who have had a schizophrenic parent who've used LSD and not had any issues. I, I personally know those people. Um, I also know people who had schizophrenic parents who used LSD and had, you know, psychedelic induced schizophrenia. I mean, they, they mm. triggered whatever that was in their minds and like it became a recurring real issue after their psychedelic use. Right. Uh, and so I think it's fair to say like, you know, fentanyl shows up in cocaine. Like that's mm. real, that happens. And if it happens and you don't have Narcan and 911 is overwhelmed and ambulances can't come, that is quite likely to result in your death. Uh, and so if you use cocaine, like having Narcan on hand right now and knowing how to use it and making sure there's somebody there sober who also knows how to use it so that if you're unconscious, there's somebody there to take care of it. Um, you know, uh, MDMA is another one where, you know, historically people treated it really, really casually. Uh, we've now had a few incidents of confirmed incidents of uh, people taking what they believed was either MDMA or MDA and there was fentanyl in it. Uh, it's not nearly as common as it is with the cocaine. The cocaine adulterated with fentanyl seems to be like disturbingly common. Um, the MDMA and MDA ones are, are very, very unusual. I, I don't want to like make it sound like this is a common 
problem. It's clearly not. Uh, but if you happen to be in that small percentage and you don't have Narcan on hand or you didn't, you know, test your substances, like you're not, you're not going to do well over the next few weeks. And people can buy Narcan at some pharmacies and the training it's is state by state. And so it's really hard to give general advice okay. about uh, getting access to Narcan. The best bet is to Google your city and free Narcan. And there's mm -hmm. often either a resource of how to get it or at least the information about why you can't get it. So like in some states you need a prescription, like you have to mm -hmm. go to your doctor and say, I'm around opiate users and need to carry Narcan. Um, Colorado actually technically requires a prescription and then I forget what the whatever the governing body is they wrote what's called an open prescription so basically mm. you technically need a prescription but the state authorities have said everyone in the state has a prescription uh -huh. <laughs> so, so you can walk in cool. you, can, you can buy Narcan there's this open and there's also needle exchanges you know harm reduction action center uh, downtown often has ways to access it and uh, so there's a lot of Colorado happens to be a, a just a really lovely state to be in if you're a substance user now. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, there's more pot shops between downtown and my house than there are coffee shops. It's far easier for me to get weed on the way home from downtown uh, than it is for me to get coffee. Uh, and also Colorado recently defelonized possession of almost every Schedule One and Schedule Two substance. So less than four grams of most drugs now is a misdemeanor, not a felony in the state of Colorado. So we're really privileged to be in a state like that I, I don't know what the situation is in Oklahoma or Texas or Louisiana about getting Narcan. Um, but, right. but, you know, Google your state, Google your city, Google free Narcan. Uh, I, I think there's ways you can get it online. I'm not 100% sure about that. I, I, I have, I, I, I don't need to deal with this often because I, I have access to Narcan. I live in Colorado. Um, if I need it, I can go buy it. Uh, and realistically, I try to keep it on me. Like when I go to events, when I go to, you know, when I go out, I try to make sure I have some on me because it really is the difference between somebody being okay and somebody not. It's a, it's a really, really amazing tool that we have as substance users to take ownership of our own substance use, our own risk and our community's risk. And so it's something that I really uh, encourage people to do. And we got a lot of pushback, you know, Dan Safe started talking about Narcan and we've partnered sometimes in, at events with Narcan trainers. So we're not mm. certified to give out Narcan, but often we can partner with somebody who is and then give it out at festivals. Mm. And we do, we get pushback on it. And I just think it's utterly absurd. Like if you're a substance user, somebody else who uses different substances, is no, <clears throat> you know, it's not, there's no better or worse. It's, it's just substance use, right? Molecules are molecules, drugs are drugs. Uh, and we should, this is a big movement. We need to be all in this together. We need to make sure that everybody is on the same page about how to stay safe, how to stay alive, how to, how to do these things. Right. And for LSD people, blotter has shown up with fentanyl on it. Uh, yeah, so, car fentanyl, but yes. Car fentanyl. Analogs, yeah. Yeah. That was in Canada and it was freaking right. Robert Hoffman bicycle day blotter. Like if you're going to put car fentanyl on blotter, can you maybe not like, like it's, it's, you know, print what it is on it. It's paper. You can label it as car fentanyl, right? Like yeah. very easy to do. It's literally paper print what it is on the freaking paper. But no, yeah. instead we bought Albert Hoffman bicycle day blotter on eBay and you know, laid car fentanyl on that. I don't, yeah. So car fentanyl is an analog. It's slightly stronger or a bunch stronger. Uh, uh, a little less than an order of magnitude. Okay. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a drug that, you know, anything that's active in like a sub two milligram dose, uh, blotter is actually probably the sort of broadly safest way for a black market dealer to distribute that. Right. right. It's really hard to sell two milligrams of powder to somebody. Um, and so anything that's active below that sort of threshold, it actually makes sense that it ends up on blotter. Um, I don't have any criticism of that as a distribution method, but you have to label what your freaking drugs are, right? So like if you're going to put 2CB fly on blotter, which is a thing that happens, uh, you know, if you're going to put DOI or DOB on blotter, you know, it, it makes sense. It's, if it's active under two milligrams, I get it. Like that's the sort of easiest, safest way to do it. But like, it's literally paper. So just print on the paper what the drug is, roughly what you think the dosage is. Um, I suspect black market laid blotter is, is really inconsistent. Um, I think that there's probably a lot of sort of inconsistency in that. When you're dealing with LSD, like if, you know, one end of your sheet is stronger than the other, it's not ideal, but it's not the end of the world. If you're dealing with carfentanil, it could be the end of someone's world. Um, and so I... 
you know, again, this is a prohibition created problem. Mm. In legal regulated markets, there is absolutely no reason that this would happen. You know, pharmacies deal with sub, micro, sub milligram drugs literally every day and they're, you know, they're within one microgram of each other. You know, you can make a thousand pills and every pill is within one microgram of the other pills. Um, we have the technology to do that. It's just legal constraints to doing that. Um, mm. You know, if we had legal regulated marketplaces where people could access whatever drugs they were hoping to consume, uh, these inconsistencies in black market distribution, you know, fentanyl showing up in other drugs, all of that goes away. Like all of those problems vanish if you do that. So right. it's sort of my solution, but uh, you know, the thing that ended uh, alcohol prohibition was really the depression. We may have some opportunities coming up to discuss drug prohibition as a policy. Uh. Uh, we need to save so, some money on the DEA. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, we spent about a trillion dollars since the drug war started. Uh, yeah, we could use that. Well, giving that to the banks every day now, but yeah. we, we still should save it if we can. Um, so kind of jumping a little bit, um, I read this amazing article that NPO Nation put out about kind of um, psychedelic tourism and different ways you could potentially transmit disease in, in like traditional ayahuasca ceremonies, like sharing cups, like rape, nasal applicators, like sharing those. Man, Huge I'll tell you, I've been real, uh, nasal applicators have worried me for a while um, because of hepatitis. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I understand in traditional, you know, shamanic communities and, and these communities, I understand that the, the norm is for mm -hmm. the facilitator to have their applicator and to use it, you know, in the circle of people. Yeah. Um, I've been saying for a while that that is not ideal or appropriate. Um, hepatitis is, like I said, it's a nasty bug. It lives on surfaces for a long time. Uh, you know, if one person in the circle has hepatitis and they're, you know, even imperceptibly bleeding in their nose, which having large amounts of tobacco blown into your sinus cavities seems like it might lead to those sort of micro, you know, fissures within your uh, nasal cavities. Uh, I have never heard of a documented case of somebody getting hepatitis through rape application. Um, I, I don't know if that's possible. I don't see any reason it wouldn't be possible. Uh, and so, yeah, as long as this remains an issue, and even if this wasn't an issue, even if COVID was not happening, um, I think that really switching to every receiver should have their own applicator, right? You should bring your own applicator to ceremony it's yours no one else uses it <laughs> like this is this is my one um but even then having somebody blow into your sinus cavities if that person is positive that's still an issue um Figure i, I out don't know applicate for sure i don't know what that looks like but you know yeah yeah i mean there are uh there are self applicators that we know from the archaeological record right mm -hmm. so the 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 inca would use uh various snuffs. Uh, so with the Taino, the Taino community in, in uh, uh, what is now Puerto Rico uh, had a, a 5-MeO-DMT, you know, the, the seeds, they would get yopo seeds and cook them with lime. And they had a self-applicator, it was sort of a bent tube that had two things that went in your nostril and then the thing went in your mouth. Um, mm -hmm. So these things existed 2,000 years ago. There's no reason we can't fabricate that technology based exactly on what was used by these traditional communities. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to know, but this idea of sitting in ceremony where the shaman is administering the substances to you, just looking at the archaeological evidence, it's clear that was not always the norm, right? I mean, they had the self-applicators. Uh, I think that very often the plants were the teachers, right? I think, I think, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how much. How, I don't know how right McKenna was on a lot of things, but uh, following plants instead of teachers, I think, is is for sure uh, something that historically was probably the norm. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that we can very easily sort of transition to, you know, if you want somebody to sit with you, if you want a guide, fine. Uh, avoid biological risk while you're doing this, right? Like, there's no reason to have somebody blowing their lung, you know, their breath into your sinus cavities. That's not necessary, it's not needed, uh, and probably was not the norm, even within those traditional communities. <clears throat> you know, if you go back into the sort of archeological and anthropological record, that was not the, the norm. It's a newer thing, we can walk away from it, it's fine. Uh, let's balance uh, ceremony with biology, right? I mean, we can, we can do that. And that's a really good point. 
what I've been reading from some folks out there is that, you know, the spirit of the plant or God will protect you because you're doing holy work. And it's like, well, you know, I'm sure you could think that, but how do you really know? And, you know, yeah, biology I, yeah. is a pretty good guarantee on prediction. Like we have pretty good understanding of how to predict biological process. Yeah, I, I am fundamentally uh, a scientific thinker. I, I uh, believe that what we know, that the word know, like what that means is those things that can be tested and replicated and repeated. Like that's just what know means. Uh, and so, yeah, we know how diseases transmit. Um, and so, you know what, if an individual wants to believe that spirit is protecting them uh, and they want to go into a situation knowing there's a risk and choosing to engage in behavior otherwise, that's fine. Uh, people are sovereigns. They can make their own choices about their substance use. I'm not going to tell somebody how to use drugs ever. Uh, as a community, we should probably be discussing these things from a more sort of balanced scientific perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this, this disease is a, a good reminder that there are real dangerous diseases out there. Uh, but even after it goes away, even if we develop a vaccine, even if we develop treatments that cut the lethality down to zero, uh, these things are not going away. We are living in increasingly interconnected, uh, increasingly dense populations. Uh, you know, animal husbandry has been overusing antibiotics for about 50 years now. We are entering a post-antibiotic era where a lot of diseases are no longer going to respond to traditional treatments. Um, and so these sorts of global pandemics are, I think, are going to become the norm rather than the exception. Uh, we get, we are lucky enough that we got to sit here for the, the first big one. Uh, you know, H1N1 was scary, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't this, mostly because we had a functioning federal pandemic response team that was able to take point on keeping it from becoming this. I think that's the thing people don't realize is that this actually has been a thing that could have happened many times over the last 20 years. We've just had functional uh, bureaucracy that was able to step in. You know, when bureaucracy operates well, you don't see it, right? It's not, it's not a thing that you notice when it's operating well. Uh, you know, when you go drink 2% milk at the grocery store, you know it's 2% milk, but you don't think about how you know that. The way you know that is because of federal bureaucracy. That's just mm -hmm. the reality of how you know what that milk is. Um, and I often use that as the sort of uh, example for why prohibition needs to end, right? When you go buy 2% milk, you know it's 2% milk because of this background bureaucracy. And that background bureaucracy can only function within legal regulated markets. It can't operate under black markets. Uh, right. And so, yeah, when a bureaucracy is working well, you don't notice the disease is just going away. Uh, what we've really seen here is the, uh, the sort of importance of, of that happening on a global scale uh, when, uh, when these diseases are, are out there and happening. And so, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's sort of where it's at is that we just have to be aware that pandemics are going to continue happening. They're going to keep getting worse. Uh, you know, even if all of us switch to a purely vegetarian diet, I think that would really help things because less animal husbandry means less use of antibiotics within the global food chain. Um, but even if we did that, it's, it's just, there's so many people, there's just so many people living so close to one another now um, that it's really just going to continue to be a, a worsening issue as the population continues to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And just hope we can figure something out to, speed our response time and adaptation right. and hopefully education around you know hey <laughs> wash your hands you yeah know, I, are yeah. you really washing your hands i really really love traveling and i'm a little concerned we might be seeing the death of global on like a sort of large scale mm -hmm. uh, i don't think that's the case uh but i will be honest that it it concerns me uh you know, if it, if it, if it happens, I guess it happens. I don't, I don't really know how to respond to a change that big within our global community. Uh, but you know, when you have a disease that's asymptomatic for 14 days and you know, a million flights a day taking off and leaving from all over the planet, the idea that somehow you would stop this disease from entering your country is a fantasy. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a completely unworkable idea that it could, you know, you could do that. Um, and even, you know, uh, native reservations in the United States, which are sovereign states, um, a lot of them have been closing their communities to outsiders. Mm. Um, 
and even that it, it just didn't work they, they didn't do it in time there's too many there's too much travel back and forth um, and so these communities are also being hit and so even when you can control your own communities literally at gunpoint right tribal police have guns like they can stop you from entering reservation land it's sovereign land they can close it to non-tribal members you are not well and even with that level of local control uh it was it wasn't enough it was not enough to stop this from spreading mm -hmm. yeah so, that's huge yeah it's, um, it's really a, a a new dynamic right and you know it's a yeah, absolutely going to lead us to a whole bunch of interesting things. Like, uh, for instance, Burning Man. I'm really hoping we're good to go yeah. by then. You but... know, August is quite a long time from now. Mm. Um, I mean, I can certainly social distance easier on the playa than I can in Denver. It's a big place. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll see what happens. But it's also on federal land. There's a lot of federal control. Uh, I am currently operating on the assumption that Burning Man is going to happen, uh, that we will be there. Uh, Dansafe is actually collaborating with a bunch of folks this year to build a harm reduction art car called the Junk of the Damned. Uh, it's a big pirate ship uh, being, being fabricated here in Denver. Uh, and I am operating on the assumption that we're going to have it on Playa this year. So that's... Yeah, awesome. That would be great. Um, this will hopefully be my first, and we'll see what happens. I'm excited. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's coming up. The hectic time of getting tickets comes up, uh, starting Wednesday. So let's see what happens. Um, cool. So have you been hearing anything else as it relates to kind of drug harm reduction, psychedelic harm reduction and COVID-19 or, or just other new disease related items? Yeah. Um, so from the opioid perspective, we've been hearing localized reports of uh, pretty serious disruption within uh, opioid supply. Uh, so like I've been hearing from people who work at methadone clinics that the clinics are just getting overwhelmed with people trying to access methadone for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't really understand oh, wow. what the dynamic is at play there. Uh, I don't actively seek out drugs all that often. So I don't know if like, you know, supplies have been disrupted universally or if it's just that people don't want to, you know, go to their, go to their guy because they're just socially distancing. Uh, but yeah, we've been hearing about disruptions within the drug supply. Uh, that's always dangerous, particularly with drugs that are, you know, cause physiological dependence. There's sort of different issues that it happened there when people are cut off. Uh, God knows if my coffee was cut off, I'd be robbing grocery stores. Uh, you know, physiological dependence is real. I am fully admitted physiologically dependent on coffee uh, as you drink yours, right? Um, but yeah, I think uh, within the psychedelic world, uh, you know, the Conclave, which is a group of uh, 5-MeO-DMT facilitators, uh, put out a statement about sort of hitting pause on any, uh, you know, gathering facilitations um you know one-on-one -on -one facilitation is a different dynamic it's a different risk analysis uh having 20 people in a room you know going around in a circle everybody using the pipe to to you know <clears throat> try toad is again a, a, a sort of known transmission vector for this disease you know if, if person three has it and puts that pipe in their mouth and then it goes in the circle uh four through 26 are going to get it right so you can't facilitate in that way at this moment in time. Um, but to see a group of facilitators proactively say, like, we are not going to be doing this, uh, I think is really meaningful. I think it's really a, an interesting thing to see that this, this group said, no, we're going to stop. Um, I've often found that the Conclave is really responsible about their facilitation. They put out statements all the time, and I, I think they're often uh, really thoughtful, really well-written, uh, considerate to the issues at hand. Uh, you know, we have a 5-MEO DMT dance safe card that's going to be released this year. Oh, good. Uh, and those Conclave folks have, yeah, I mean, once Mike Tyson's talking about it on ESPN, clearly dance safe needs a card. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of them, a lot of the Conclave folks sort of helped us on the, the text development of that, of that card. And I, I, I've been really impressed. I think they really have thought about these issues very, very deeply. And the fact that they mm -hmm. immediately said like, no, we have to put a halt on doing this. Um, one of the other things I really like about the Conclave is that they, as part of their sort of general standards of practice, they say, like, you should really try to avoid this becoming your main source of income. 
you know, being a, being a psychedelic facilitator, uh, if that's your main source of income, you now have a financial motive towards expanding your business. And these substances should not be marketed in that way, right? We shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be taking out billboards, try toad. Like that's not where we want to go with these things. As much as the billboards would be fun. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to lie. The billboards would be interesting. Um, I think these are not just 5-MeO DMT, but other psychedelics as well. I'm a, I'm a believer in, I believe these things are, you know, they're, they're valuable sort of tools for understanding our own psyche. They're valuable for, you know, uh, <laughs> Rick, Rick's comment just said note to self cancel billboards um, you know I, but I am I'm a believer in the power of these of these tools um, I mean clearly through the phase two trials now we have seen MDMA assisted psychotherapy works like I'm comfortable saying that as a sentence now like we know that right from a scientific context it's replicatable it's repeatable it's testable it's a, a hypothesis that we put out there and we now know it works uh, and so I'm not going to tell people that these things are not what they are because they are, they're really, really, really valuable tools for understanding what we are, you know, how a, a few pound lump of gelatinous matter became self-aware and knows that it's a few pound lump of gelatinous matter is the grand mystery. It's the big question. And so having tools to examine that question are super important. And mm. these are the microscopes, right? These are the telescopes. These are the tools for understanding our own neurological processes and how we became self-aware as a species. Uh, yeah. Maybe in the midst of a global pandemic is not the time for self-experimentation. Like, I think that's, I think that's fair to say, like, if you're not going to the grocery store, if you're not, you know, if you're not uh, going to the mountains to go skiing, if you're not going to see your friends, if you're taking all of these sort of, you know, changed behaviors to reduce your personal risk, uh, maybe it's worth considering also changing your substance use behavior. Uh, you know, not forever. I'm not saying everyone needs to give up drugs. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, but it's it's a real consideration to think about. It's a real thing to, you know, but if you are going to do these things, certainly you have to do everything you can to be as safe as possible. You know, mm -hmm. make sure there's somebody there to keep an eye on you, make sure you know what you're taking, make sure you know what the dose is, you know, do everything you can, you know, have Narcan on hand, use a safe, safer snorting, all the things that we recommend all the time. Like these are all things that Dan Safe says you should always do, right? You should always do these things. Uh, the, the urgency is uh, increased. You know, and we're still shipping test kits. Uh, you, you know, uh, global shipping services have not been disrupted. So we're still, you know, making the kits and getting them into people's hands. Uh, personally, I view it as a critical sort of uh, harm reduction medical service. Uh, even if they tried to shut down manufacturing, which I don't see happening, but if they tried to shut down all non-essential mail, I think we could make a strong argument that we actually qualify as essential. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be certainly an interesting argument. <laughs> I don't think it's going to get there, but it's a thing I've been, you know, thinking about is as I'm watching things that a year ago I would have said were impossible happen one after the other, after the other, after the other. Uh, it's worth thinking about other impossible situations. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing that we can do as a community uh, to really make sure that everyone is safe as possible is when you see misinformation being spread within our community, call it out. Like when you see people posting things that are, are you know, easily fact checkable, false, uh, don't let that spread. Cause I'm seeing just a ton of it within the festival community. I mean, mm. just a ton. I mean, strapping a hairdryer to your face is not going to keep you safe from COVID-19. Like I just- Someone like, said that? That's a thing. Yeah, this is a, this is a video going around. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I tried to watch it. It was giving me- Cause it blows the molecules away from your mouth and nose or something. Yeah, no, so the idea is yeah. that if it heats up your air to like 150 <clears throat> degrees or whatever, oh, the Jesus. virus can't, the virus can't live. Like, don't, like, that's clearly right. not true, right? It's clearly, it's easily <laughs> fact checkable. Like, don't spread that sort of thing. Don't perpetuate that sort of, you know, misinformation. You know, there's pictures going around super viral today of like mass graves in Italy. And as soon as I looked at the pictures, I was like, that's clearly a film set. Like the quality of photograph is clearly through a video, a video camera. That is a film set. And like, I did a reverse image search and there was pictures from seven years ago of that exact, I mean, it took me three seconds to like figure out that this was not true, right? So like be a little skeptical 
of anything you hear, anything you see being perpetuated, you know, rubbing, rubbing coconut oil on the inside of your nose is another one I've seen. Like, <laughs> it's not how viruses spread. They don't spread from the, they go into your sinus cavities. Like, unless you are, you know, shooting, and don't do that either, right? Don't, don't take a syringe of coconut oil and shoot it in your sinus cavities. But inside of your nose is not where the viruses get in. They get in through your, through your, you know, through your sinus cavities that have mm. veins, bypass your lymphatic system. And like, that's where they're getting in. They're not getting in here. They're getting in here. Uh, but people are scared. I get that. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to people, uh, literally when you're scared, right. You're, uh, you're, when, when that happens, when you have a fear response in your brain, it actually suppresses your like reasoning centers in your brain. It literally biologically makes you a less rational person when you're afraid. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. you don't have time to reason things out when a lion is running at you across the savannah. Right, it makes sense that we would be biologically primed towards action under moments of fear. There's a strong evolutionary advantage to that. It makes sense when you're holding a stick in the jungle, you know, and you're like a barely bipedal primate. Like I, I get all of the reasons, but you can know that about yourself and like, you know, sort of rebuild the patterns to like, oh wait, my natural skepticism is biochemically suppressed. I should sit and really think about this thing that I'm like, I've started to believe, right? Like really mm. critically examine the evidence, really look for it. Like this is not some, you know, global psyops to like take down the deep state. It's a fucking virus. You can get it. It'll make you sick. Like don't pretend that you can just go out in public because the virus is a hoax. It's not a hoax. There's a lot of people dying. Uh, treat it as what it is, which is a global pandemic of a really virulent disease uh, that we as a society have not dealt with in a long time. 1918 was the last time we dealt with a disease like that. Um, one of my great grandparents died in the flu of 1918. Uh, you know, anyone who's done genealogical record research, when you hit 1918, there's a lot of ending years at 1918. There's a lot of deaths that year. Um, you literally see it in the census records, like all of these normal distribution curves of deaths. And then you hit that generation and it's just like 1918 to 1919 is like a massive block of deaths. And, you know, 50 years from now, looking at census data, you're going to see this year. You're going to see it. You're going to see it in the data. Uh, and we get to know that ahead of time. In 1918, everybody just thought it was a local sort of thing, right? It took a long time for the news to sort of spread, to recognize it as a global pandemic. Uh, we have an advantage in the sense that we can see what's happening and respond really, really quickly. Uh, and so we should, we should be serious about this. Because I like my friends and I don't want my friends to die. <laughs> like, I, I really, I like all of you. And so, uh, and there's, you know, there's age curves, you know, it's a, it's clearly much more serious the older you get. Uh, there was just a, a, a Vox article that came out today that pulled all of the data from the World Health Organization and China and Italy and Spain and looked at the sort of distribution curves of all of these deaths. Uh, it's clearly far more dangerous if you are, you know, in your 50s, 60s, 70s uh, and older. The older you get, the, the higher statistical probability of death. But there are deaths represented for every age bracket. I, I think other than, I think under 19, there have been no deaths that didn't have pre-existing conditions. I would have to check the raw data, but it, it is a possibility that anyone who gets this could die. And so you should think of it like that type of disease, right? It's one of those diseases that can actually kill you regardless of pre-existing conditions, regardless of, you know, your age. Uh, and also like, you know, keep your grandparents alive. And if your grandparents aren't alive, keep our, keep everyone else's grandparents alive. Like yeah. you're still shedding this virus for a long time after you get it, you know, sometimes 14 days to show symptoms, uh, then you're sick for, you know, a month. Uh, and then there's some evidence now that for a month after that, you might still be viral shedding. So we're talking about a three month period where you can get other people sick. That's a really long time to be getting everyone in your community ill. Uh, and so we should be treating this as, as seriously as it needs to be. Uh, and, you know, I think if there's one lesson of the psychedelic experience. I don't know that there is one lesson, but <laughs> if there is one lesson of the psychedelic experience, it's arguable that the lesson is that we really are all one, right? So there's the famous story about the guy who asked his guru, you know, he says, uh, you know, guru, how should we treat others? 
And the answer is there are no others, right? That was the, the answer. Uh, so like be kind to your community, uh, you know, be kind to the global community, even the people who still think this is a hoax, we should be kind to them too. It's, 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 it's a hard lesson. I, lo I love calling out bullshit. It's like one of my favorite things to do in the world. Uh, I'm trying to be careful about how I message calling out bullshit uh, because you really want people to hear the message. You don't want to just, you know, have that message go past them. Uh, and this is a, a unique moment in our history as a species. It's the first global pandemic where we've seen it in real time unfolding. Uh, we sort of know what the solutions are. We have the ability to rapidly develop the technologies to fix it. Uh, I think this is a sort of watershed moment in human history. We're connecting on a global scale about how to address these issues. Uh, and we have a, a, a chance here to really start recognizing that you know, nation states and borders are fictions. They're, they're, they're collective hallucinations and nature doesn't give a fuck about them. <laughs> like nature does not care about borders. It doesn't care about what your nationality is. It doesn't care about where you were born. It's, it just doesn't care because those things aren't real. And once you recognize those things aren't real, you can really start thinking about not what's good for your own particular tribe, your own particular nation, but how do we as a global community create a planet that works for everybody? Uh, mm. You know, we're really lucky in this country. We, all, everyone in this country won the birth lotto. No matter how hard your life is in the United States, it was not made harder by the fact that you were born in the United States, right? And so they're, they're really, we, we as a privileged community, both as people from the US, as psychedelic users, people with the internet, right? Anyone watching this by definition is with sort of within the global 5% at least. Mm. Uh, we have an obligation to use our advantages to help those who are most disadvantaged. Because no matter how hard coronavirus is for you sitting here in the US, like once this starts going through the global south, once it starts hitting Africa, South America, Latin America, like the numbers are gonna be horrific and we have, to, we have to take care of those people too. You know, I think we've, we've really learned Oh, you know, the, the argument when the global pandemic response team was dismantled in 2019, when Trump was dismantling this team is why should Americans be paying to like help the health of all the people throughout the world? Like, well, <laughs> this is why, right? Like, welcome to the fucking answer. Uh, the answer is that the planet is one universal interconnected organism. And when it gets sick anywhere, it gets sick everywhere. Mm. Very quickly. Very, very quickly. Like, I don't care where you're living. I don't care how isolated you are. This is going to hit you. Uh, and so we have to start thinking of the earth in that way. And psychedelics seem to help. I, uh, you know, I, I, I like to believe, I, you know, I, I sort of vacillate between psychedelics or non-specific amplifiers of human creativity on the one side, because like there are actual Nazis who use DMT. So like, I can't, you know, I can't uh, uh, pretend that's not a thing. Uh, but properly messaged with the proper set and setting, uh, MDMA in particular, but all sort of other psychedelics in general, seem like they can lead to an increased sense of connectivity with the rest of humanity. They can. Uh, and so as a psychedelic community, that's the message we need to be pushing, right? Is that the planet cannot survive this sort of tribalistic, nation state thinking that we've been using for the last several hundred years. It can't survive. It's just, the, it's too interconnected. There's too many dangers. There's too many things happening. You know, the idea of like sovereign nations are great. They've gotten us really, really far. Uh, you know, when one sovereign nation puts up a nuclear reactor directly next to the, you know, border of another, you know, when diseases spread on airplanes like this, it really lays bare the sort of weakness of that system. Uh, and so we have to move, at least in a general sort of uh, public health sense, um, we can no longer pretend that borders mean anything because they just, they just don't. I'm, I'm sort of hyper aware of this issue because of my need to monitor black market drug trends. Uh, you know, we see waves of certain things happening in different places and they move. You can watch the waves move of these black market drugs. And black market drugs don't care about borders any more than diseases do. They just, they flow through borders like water. Uh, and so you really, 
when you study black market drug trends, which is something I actually study quite deeply, it's something I'm sort of very engaged with. You know, I check, I check, uh, you know, uh, dark web sources all the time. I look at the drug checking results from multiple countries over time. And you, it's a really interesting parallel to disease in that you can watch these trends happening in a way that clearly just does not care about the sort of, you know, collective hallucination of borders. Like, you know, people are like, oh, well, let's, you know, I, I hear all the time, you know, oh, the opioid crisis is so bad in America. It's the reason we need to build a wall, right? If we have a wall on our southern border, the opiate crisis will stop. Except yeah. if you look at a distribution <laughs> of fentanyl deaths, fentanyl deaths are actually <clears throat> rare along the border and cluster and radiate from port cities. Mm. So areas that have connections to the traditional, uh, you know, Mexican cartel distribution networks have less fentanyl, less fentanyl deaths, because they have real heroin. They have heroin that comes over the border and radiates out. So if we did manage to build the wall, I think what you would see is the largest increase in opioid deaths in our history. As heroin drops off, the fentanyl is still moving in from ports. It's being delivered by... USPS. USPS is undeniably the largest drug dealer in the world, or at least the largest drug delivery service in the world. Uh, and so you would see this radiating out pattern of fentanyl deaths from all of the port cities would expand uh, and it would result in a massive increase. You can't arrest your way out of a problem you arrested your way into. Like fentanyl exists because heroin's illegal. And so further criminalizing substance use doesn't fix anything. And, you know, pretending we can do the same thing with a global virus, we're just going to close the borders. It's like, that's not how, that's not how borders are. Like, it's not how, it's not how any of this works, you know? And so, yeah, it's just, uh, man, this is, some, some, someone needs to write a book on this subject, the parallels between black market drug trades and pandemic response, but I'm not writing that book. <laughs> it would be idea. very topical. I, I would actually think it would sell okay. Uh, Maybe I'll, maybe Hopefully. I'll do, maybe I'll try to get an article in Wall Street Journal or something. Yeah, that's a great one. Have you been published in Wall Street Journal? What was that? Have you been published in like uh, any big no. papers? No, No. I mean, I get, I get quoted in articles all the time, but right. Um, no, I, I very, I very, I am slowly writing a book uh, way too slowly, but most of my writing goes into Google Docs right now. So not on, not on the internet. Right on. Cool. Um, yeah, the black market dynamics are, are so interesting. And the fact that people like I assume you read Narconomics. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like I that, have it. uh, it's somewhere on this bookshelf behind me. Really, just a you know, if you're going to study the black markets and the drug war, it's a great place to start. Um, just really gives you real analysis on you know what would work, what doesn't work, <laughs> and what yeah. we're doing, and yeah, how these organizations relate to um, corporate infrastructure. You know, yeah. it's just really fascinating. I, yeah. And you know, I, there was a Milton Friedman quote, who's not a person who I agree with on virtual, <laughs> uh, but his analysis of the drug war was actually spot on. And what he said is that from an economic perspective, the role of the government in the drug war is to protect the cartels, right? That's literally what government does is by criminalizing the drug trade, it creates a sphere where legitimate actors cannot come in. And so from an economic perspective, that is what the government does. They protect the drug cartels by, by forcing only the people who are willing to break the law are the only ones who can get involved in that marketplace. Um, and so they've created a, a racket where normal market functions don't operate. You know, on a material resource basis, in terms of cost of production, if people who produce sugar actually had to pay for their externalities, if they actually had to pay to clean up the mess they make, Heroin is cheaper to produce on a material resource basis than sugar. Heroin is not an intrinsically expensive thing. The reason that people have to engage in other criminal behavior to afford the amount of heroin they need uh, to avoid going into like with physiological withdrawals, the only reason that heroin is expensive is because we've made it illegal. So I hear all the time people say, oh, how could we legalize heroin? People will be robbing everyone to afford it. It's like, no, nah, it's like it's only, it's only expensive because of the criminal black markets. Opium grows really easily. And actually, uh, northern New Mexico is almost the exact climatological conditions. The sort of Sandia Mountains in New Mexico would be just perfect. I mean, you just throw poppy seeds on the ground and they'll, they'll sprout. Uh, and so we could produce, you know, I, I strongly suspect that we could produce all of the heroin that is consumed in this country uh, for the cost of incarcerating maybe 15 or 20 heroin users. 
So like, let's like, yeah, like, let's just, you know, let's just do that. <laughs> like, let's, let's save hundreds of millions of dollars a year and just give anyone who needs opiates their opiates. Uh, right. And, you know, like the, the criticism is who's going to pay for it. And I'm like, well, who, paid for, who pays for it now? Who pays for the jail cells and the police and the prosecutors and the district attorneys, the, the cars we're using to transport them and the night vision goggles the DEA uses? Like, you know, who pays for all of this crap? Like, it's, it's us. We pay for it. Who would prefer to save the money? <laughs> uh, you know, we, we have a lot of places to spend it. Yeah, I feel um, like uh, ending the drug war is a really bipartisan proposition. You, you can get the economic totally. conservatives on board. You can get the libertarians. Uh, for me, the argument is always a cognitive liberty argument. I just fundamentally believe that humans have a right to do whatever they want with their minds and bodies. Period. Like, that's that's the end of the conversation for me. Um, mm. I have found that argument to be remarkably unpersuasive on politicians. <laughs> the economic arguments work really well on politicians. Uh, the mm. cognitive liberty arguments, uh, not, not so much. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I... I haven't really gone down that rabbit hole. I try not to spend too much time with politicians, but I might need to eventually. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. It's uh, Politics is only slightly less important than your own heartbeat. <laughs> right. Were you involved in the defelonization bill at uh, all? I sort of lending my sort of support on the, you know, I, I was at the same time we were uh, removing test kits from the drug paraphernalia uh, oh, good. definition in the state of Colorado. Um, and so that was sort of where my focus was, was uh, doing that. Uh, certainly every time I met with somebody around the test kit issue, I also expressed, you know, my strong support for the defelonization bill. Mm. Um, my hope is now that possession is a misdemeanor instead of a felony, uh, is that we can open a drug, che drug checking services at a community health clinic somewhere here in Colorado. So I want to start having drop-in drug checking days where anybody could bring their drugs. Oh. Um, and we could publicly advertise, analyze the substances. Uh, by locating it in a community health clinic, we would create like a sort of HIPAA bubble that would make it difficult for law enforcement to target anyone who was coming to these services because they don't know mm. if they're coming for, you know, pregnancy tests or STD testing or drug checking or, you know. And so if you create a sort of bubble like that, it's virtually impossible for law enforcement to target or disrupt your services. Um, and so this is one of my big goals uh, about this is uh, we really need to uh, sort of focus on, on how we can make drug checking what it is, which is a purely public health service, right? This is, this is a public health community health service Realistically, community health clinics should put DanSafe out of operation, right? Like it should be something that is provided by the government taxpayer funded, let me go work on something else. <laughs> like, uh, and so, you know, this is where I think we need to focus on uh, uh, our, our sort of efforts on is turning, not turning drug checking into a public health service because drug checking is a public health service. Uh, what we need to do is focus on changing the public perception of that public health service, right? So doing it in a booth at a festival is great. I, I don't ever want to stop doing it. It's amazing. Like, I love doing it. Uh, that should be a very small part of what drug checking looks like. Because really, the only people who can access our services are people who are at these events, which by definition means they are economically better off. They just, they're into a certain type of music. I mean, there's so many gates that stop people from being able to access our services. Um, but if I'm offering it at a community health clinic in every major city in the country, right? Uh, that's a different type of service. It's a different, you know, thing. And like, you know, the drug misrepresentation, opioid deaths are killing 50 to 70,000 people a year right now. It's a 9-11 every 21 days. Like that's, that's insane. Or no, every 14, sorry. It's a 9-11 every 14 days. This is, this is insane. I mean, this is, this is the fact that we're not taking a, any sort of response to a 9-11 every couple weeks is is crazy to me and i can end those deaths 
right? I can end them. Like fentanyl showing up in your other drugs and not knowing how strong your drugs are is a solvable problem. <laughs> like it's actually not even that difficult of a problem to solve. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, that's how we need to start messaging this is like, no, we can end these deaths. These are not drug deaths. These are, these are drug prohibition deaths, top to bottom, front to back, drug prohibition deaths. We have to talk about it that way. We have to talk about it that way with our grandparents, right? We have to talk about it that way on the evening news. We have to talk about it that way with politicians. These are drug prohibition deaths created by government policy, fixable by government policy. Done, we can end it. Uh, it's just so, so hard to get people to wrap their minds around that because the drug war has been really, really good at marketing right? It's the drug problem is solvable by prohibition. And they create the problem through prohibition and then use the problem they created as a reason why we need further prohibition. It's really an astonishingly effective marketing campaign that the DEA has undertaken uh, to convince people that we need to continue a policy that is actually creating the problem that they ostensibly claim to be trying to solve. Right. Yeah. And tying that back into <clears throat> this disease issue, you know, people could be procuring their own baggies of MDMA, RAPE, nose applicators, you know, ayahuasca, LSD, whatever, like you don't need to use black market necessarily unclean drugs. You could get at least food grade drugs, if not sure. pharma grade drugs in your own baggie. Sure. You know? Super easy, yeah. right? I mean, it's, it, it's, it, and we can talk about what regulation looks like. I think that there's a galaxy of regulatory possibilities, right? I'm not necessarily saying sell heroin at 7-Eleven, uh, but I genuinely believe selling heroin at 7-Eleven would be less dangerous than what we're doing now. I really sure. do. Yeah. Um, I do think that for a lot of substances that we should be talking not about legalization in the anyone can sell it sense, um, but a regulated marketplace, right? There should be licensing, there should be inspections, there should, all of the things that we do with other drugs like alcohol and tobacco. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think that uh, E-Man has a term, I think legal regulation or it's something along those lines, right? You want to work the word regulation right into the, right into the thing, right? We're not talking about everyone can, you know, go buy their cocaine at 7-Eleven or mm. everyone can get LSD. You know, 11 year olds probably should not be taking LSD. I, I'm pretty yeah. okay. <laughs> um, yeah. And so we need to create regulated, structured marketplaces. Uh, you know, I, I, it took me a long time. I started looking for LSD when I was like 13, 14. It took me a while to find it. Um, okay. But I was certainly able to find MDMA by the time I was 13, 14. Mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, MDMA is a, a, a powerful substance that's, you know, really targeting serotonin receptors in your forebrain. Uh, maybe taking it at 14, not a great idea. Uh, I have no idea if it did anything because I was a child and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know what, what's different now compared to then. You could have been at NASA. Yeah. I mean, what would I do at NASA though? Like, yeah, right. How about we fix this phone before we, how about this we terraform, more important, before we for terraform sure. Mars? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the, the disease thing adds another dynamic, but what I really think this disease is doing, not just for substance use. I think this is actually a, a general statement. Uh, COVID-19 has revealed all of the sort of uh, flaws within all the systems, right? It's, it's when you put pressure on a system, it reveals the cracks, right? Too much weight on the dam and you start to see where the cracks in the dam are. Uh, and I think COVID-19 has started to reveal all of the flaws within the various sort of interlocking systems that make up the United States. Uh, and that's true for substance use. It's sort of revealed where the dangers are within substance use. Uh, you know, the fact that like people can't pay rent, which means their landlord can't pay their mortgage and the bank can't pay their servicing. Like the fact that everyone is leveraged to 99% all the way up the chain uh, is a flaw within the system that has been invisible because of the sort of functioning of the system. But boy, we had just like a, like, how is it possible that these billion dollar corporations can't go 10 days of disrupted services without massive layoffs? How is it possible that a seven billion dollar corporation doesn't have ten days of operating cash? Um, and so, yeah, I think it's revealed the the flaws within prohibition. Um, mm. It's made all of the things that are dangerous about substance use more dangerous. Uh, 
I don't know if it's necessarily introduced any sort of new intrinsic dangers, right? Snorting substances has always exposed people to bloodborne pathogens. That is that has always been a risk. It's something that people should have never, you know, you should never be sharing dollar bills when you're snorting substances. Uh, you should always be using individual ROP applicators. Like those are all things that have existed. Uh, but boy, has this brought them to the forefront. <laughs> like, mm. Yeah, for sure. It's really, really kind of crazy. <laughs> um, backing up briefly, um, and it's somewhat tangential, but <laughs> this idea of reg regulated markets, um, whenever I talk about this, people get furious. It's a really political issue inside the psychedelic world where people ha have this line. I'm sure you've heard the line. I don't want what happened to cannabis to happen to psychedelics. Sure. I'm like, what on earth are you talking about? It blows my mind. I, I understand that people think, you know, yeah, capitalism is racist. Sure. Sure is, especially in this country. But, you know, I, what kind of response do you have to like that kind of a comment? Yeah. I, a core part of my personal philosophy mm. is that I refuse to let the idea of the perfect become the enemy of the good. Yeah. So yeah. like, you, you can have this idea of like what the perfect world should look like. And we should, we should all have that idea. Uh, if you become so married to that idea that you won't take steps that move in that direction because you're not reaching the end goal, you're never gonna get anywhere. Uh, and so, yeah, do I think an ideal world is one in which, you know, marginalized indigenous communities have full ownership of their historic medicines and are the ones that, a hundred percent. Like, uh, you know, look, the, the, the Mishtek shamans who've been using mushrooms as part of an unbroken religious tradition going back 5,000 years in the highlands of Mexico clearly have more skin in the game than somebody growing mushrooms in their closet. <laughs> I, there, there is no arguing with that, with that idea. Uh, does that mean that we should criminalize the person growing mushrooms in their closet? Like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so like we can talk about what an ideal world looks like where the money and the power is going to these indigenous communities that have been so hurt by the war on drugs and so hurt by colonialism and before that so hurt by the, you know, by the Inquisition. Uh, we can talk about that and we can move in that direction and we can do all of that. Look, do I love the corporate takeover of cannabis for lack of a better term? Like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't love that dynamic that these, you know, uh, white business owners who, you know, the people who were taking the risk to develop these genetics under prohibition should be the ones benefiting now that it's legal, right? Like, obviously, the communities most hurt by the war on drugs are the ones who should benefit from ending the war on drugs. You know, the sentencing disparity between powder cocaine and crack cocaine was pure racism. There was no sort of rational reason to do that other than the need to criminalize young men of color. Like, we should talk about that. We should work on fixing that. We should absolutely do all those things. Do I think it's better to have a bunch of like rich corporations growing pot than throwing people in fucking jail for a dime bag? Like, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, we're, we are better now than we were 10 years ago. Uh, and I hope that in 10 years we're better than we are now. Uh, but I just flat refuse to let this, you know, this vision of utopia prevent us from moving in the right direction. Mm. Uh, we are going to get where we need to go in incremental steps. Right. Uh, so actually, I, I, I used to argue with young earth creationists on the Internet all the time. Like it was a big hobby of mine for a long time. Uh, and one of the statements, you know, they always try to throw up this false dichotomy between macro and micro evolution. Right. Oh, there's little changes, but the big changes are impossible. And the argument I would always use is how in the world could you not walk 100 miles one step at a time? Right. Like if you keep taking the steps, how do you not end up 100 miles down the road? Uh, and I feel the same way about these sort of incremental changes in drug policy. Like, yeah, I want to end the DEA and I want to end the drug war and I want to free all the prisoners and I want to create legal regulated marketplaces and have restorative social justice for the communities hurt by these things. And I want to do all of that. Uh, if I wait for some one piece of federal legislation to do all of that, I'm going to die very unsatisfied as an old, not of COVID-19, I'm going to die as a 106 year old man in my bed, you know, uh, uh, but very unhappy with where we are. Uh, and so like, take the steps take the incremental steps. Uh, you know, I, when we removed test kits from paraphernalia language here in Colorado, I really wanted to just nuke the paraphernalia laws. 
Like, why should things you use to take drugs ever be criminalized? Why should any of that be a criminal charge, right? It's, it's fucking ludicrous that these things are, are crimes. Uh, do I think the law would have passed if that was what we tried to do? No. So, like, we can now legally distribute test kits and fentanyl strips in the state of Colorado. Uh, that is a step in the right direction, and I'm happy about that step. Mm. Will you be able to sell in stores? Like, do you think you'll have distribution at, like, uh, head yeah. shops and whatnot? Yeah, 100%. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, so we really did it in New Mexico, and in New Mexico, there's a chain of family-owned pharmacies that carries them. Oh, Wow. That's really cool. What's it so called? They have the empty bottles on the shelf because you have to keep them refrigerated. Right. Um, but then you can just say like, oh, I need the MDMA test kit. And they have that at, like in their fridge. Oh, that's fantastic. At a pharmacy. Wow. Yeah. Like that's a major change. And it yeah. wouldn't, it, these things wouldn't happen if we waited for the drug war to be over. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are, you know, depending on how you count, we're somewhere between 70 and 100 years into drug prohibition. Uh, that is a lot of legislative inertia. That's a lot of like social inertia that's been moving in that direction. You're not going to stop a, you know, 200 foot fully loaded ocean liner on a dime. Like it's going to take time and energy to redirect the focus of what we've been doing. So a really good friend of a uh, friend of the show, um, psychedelics today has, he comes from a Mormon background and had some, issues that were sorted out through various psychedelic use and he was able to get his mother to start donating to maps uh, old mormon lady wow. through you know example to say hey, like hey look look what i've been able to do and um <laughs> now we have mormons actively donating which is extraordinary that's amazing um, and, yeah. and you know, I, I i constantly tell people like if you're in a position to be out as a substance user it's super powerful, right? Nothing will change an old angry person more than their own grandkid coming and saying, Hey, like this thing you believe is bullshit, right? Like it worked with gay rights. Like it worked. This is how social progress happens is by like your grandkids telling you like, Hey grandma, those people you hate, like I'm one of them. Uh, and so like, if you have the ability to, to be out to your, you know, your family as somebody who gained benefit from psychedelic use, like that's a really powerful contribution to the movement to like, to tell them that like, no, like I was depressed in high school and I used psychedelics and they helped me like parents hearing that hear that. Uh, and so, yeah, no, that's, I think that's a real part of the dynamic. Uh, you know, maybe not over the next three weeks. I think that over the next three weeks, we have, we have other things we should be talking to our parents yeah. about. Just Don't be nice to each other for a little bit. If you're 70 years old, stay in your house, right? Like, yeah. um, there's other yeah. things we can talk to our parents about for the next couple of weeks. But in, a, in a, a broader sense, I do think that's a really, really powerful part of the part of the conversation. Yeah, an example, my 95-year-old, very uh, Republican Fox News style uh, grandma met my girlfriend who opened one of the first cannabis dispensaries in the state here in Breckenridge. And it, it's been a secret for a number of years and then wow. you know it started we started like opening up and she asked at one point and what do you do what were you doing for work and like a series of questions it isn't pot is it and it, it sounded like it was going to be a really aggressive scenario but it really just like you know because there was a relationship already there it just like kind of whoop, right. chilled out um I, th I thought we were going to get kicked out of multiple people's homes in the past but we didn't, <laughs> we didn't. Excellent. it was great there's some really funny phrases coming out, but yeah, uh, coming out helps a lot. And so I think we're what we're, we're ten minutes out. Is there? We should probably ways? begin to figure out how to wrap this up. Yeah. Um, so uh, we. If anyone received... has any questions, if they want to drop them in the, uh, if they want to drop yeah. them in the thing. So related to dance safe psychedelics, um, disease, anything you really want to ask. There was a speculative question here about like. Ha, do we think the MDMA trials and maps were slowed down because of this? I, you know, I imagine maybe a little bit, but I don't, I can't imagine it to be a lot. Um, you know, people are slowing down their interactions, which is a good thing. <laughs> so maybe, maybe a little, but I don't think by a lot. Um, question here. Oh, <laughs> Ed, you're right. We have a great time in Colorado. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, no, it's already it's, pretty I... crowded, but, um, Come on down if you want it. Well, not this week. <laughs> <laughs> Man. 
ghost town here in Breckenridge. Um, Tara Rodriguez, if you're a dance safe volunteer, is there a way to get a discount on a test kit? Yep, there is. Yeah, any volunteers uh, get discounted test kits. Uh, they also get opportunities to volunteer at events, um, which is amazing and super fun and uh, something I realistically don't get to do as often as I wish I did because I'm sort of uh, keeping the back end balls all in the air. Uh, but yeah, no, th there is a way to do that usually through your local chapter. Uh, and so, yeah, another good reason to, to get trained as a volunteer. Yeah, it's a fantastic organization. I recommend everybody take the training and try to get uh, to some events. <laughs> you know, if you don't have a chapter in your city, you know, you could probably start one. Yeah, it's true. So next one here, how bad do you think the illicit drug supply will be affected? I think it will be affected. I don't know by how much. Um, I'm seeing some articles saying prices are going up a, a lot, which could drive people away from opiate pills to pay, to heroin or worse. Yeah. And benzo addicts, like that's going to be a really tough situation because I'm sure rehabs are going to be popping off. Um, if they can stay if, open. If they, yeah, if I'm, I'm hearing some places are talking about closing their rehab clinics and it's pretty yeah. creepy. Um, psychedelic supply. I don't know, like acid is pretty, holds okay. Mushrooms kind of hold okay. Yeah, and um, they're also, you know, uh, mushrooms are easy to produce locally. Uh, and, you know, LSD, you know, 10,000 doses takes up almost no room at all if it's powder. Uh, and so as long as the, you know, postal systems keep working, it's difficult to see like massive disruption within the LSD market. Um, it's just It's just hard to imagine anything that could effectively uh, you know, work as like an interdiction method against something where a gram of powder is 10,000 doses. Like it's just impossible to stop that from moving anywhere, um, including like into prisons, right? Like people in prison right. uh, can get acid all the time. It's like one of the things that's actually relatively easier to get uh, in prisons because the smuggling is so much easier than, you know, smuggling pot or tobacco into prisons is like a whole process. Oof. Maintaining an active cigarette habit in prison would be outrageous. I, yeah, I'd yeah. sign up for acid instead. But, <laughs> you know, DMT, I can't really see like DMT getting hit too hard. Yeah, um, agreed. I think psychedelic chains are probably relatively stable. Right. Um, yeah, it, until they shut down postal systems, but I don't think that's happening. I'm right, which I don't see happening. The post office is open. Um, yeah, I can't really think of any drug that's going to... many people receive medications by mail? Like, I, the idea of closing off the postal system would be a death sentence to a lot of people. Um, and so that's the reason I just don't see postal services shutting down, like, period. So Jim Hunt from Australia is asking, um, or stating, that a lot of the precursors, which is a great question for you, a lot of the precursors for MDMA and meth uh, in Australia are from Asia. I don't know about the U.S. Do you, do you know anything about... Um, amphetamine precursors and yeah so the I mean the PMK and PMK glycodate which are sort of the two big precursors for MDMA are certainly sort of Asian heavy precursors like I would say you know it's hard to know where most of them come from but certainly a lot mm -hmm. of them are out of Asia um, yeah I mean I guess if we saw sort of a disruption in global chemistry uh, there might be sort of down chain dis disruption within the drug markets I could see that happening uh, for drugs like MDMA, speed, uh, you know, anything that has a plant base, like anything that starts as a plant, uh, you know, I guess mushrooms technically aren't a plant, f fun, plant or fungi, uh, but, you know, mushrooms, uh, LSD, the precursors are so tiny compared to your yield that, you know, I, I guess MDMA and meth are two that I could, I could actually theoretically see some disruption in the chain. Uh you know, we've moved away from saffron oil as a precursor to MDMA globally. Like there's just, the saffron oil is not really the main precursor anymore. Uh, there is so much PMK glycodate like in the distribution chain. If this went on for years, I could see some sort of down chain uh, disruptions. I don't think we're looking at years of global capitalism being disrupted. Uh, Capitalism is a remarkably resilient system. Uh, and so I see it seeing, I, I, what I see is it being resilient. That's what I suspect is gonna happen. Um, but man, I've been wrong about so much lately. It's hard to know. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's one of the, the main thoughts is that um, plants are the source and 
it's not necessarily always true that these are the precursor sources. But, yeah, MDMA uh, has not been primarily produced from saffron oil for many years now. Um, once industrial precursors sort of come on the market, they're generally easier to get in transport than anything natural. And so you just sort of see a switch to the synthetic precursors if they're available. Cool. It's actually the development of PMK glycodate as a precursor probably did more to preserve the Cambodian rainforest than like any ecological protection group in the last hundred years has done. So whoever, <laughs> whichever chemists figured out how to produce MDMA from PMK glycodate and like publish that information, uh, really ecological heroes in my mind. Like they really did a lot for the Cambodian rainforests. And so we owe them a, a big debt of gratitude, even if they can't collect their Nobel Prize without facing some time. <laughs> right. I mean, um, I had an interview lined up with Wade Davis and I really wanted to talk to him about the cocaine topic and like rainforest destruction yeah. um, based on, based on what I see as, you know, the drug wars causing ecological devastation down there because they can't set up sus sustainable grows yeah. or sustainable yeah. labs. So I think one last thing to talk about before we bounce is there is actually a technological solution to a lot of these problems, which is drug producing yeasts and E. coli. Yeah. Working on genetically modifying yeasts in E. coli to produce various drugs. Uh, and once those things are sort of on, once those things are operational, once those systems are operational, uh, we will actually see things like homebrew heroin, homebrew cocaine, uh, homebrew MDMA. Uh, all of those things are, are within the sort of realm of technological possibility now. Uh, and we're probably only a few years out from a lot of them. The homebrew morphine exists. Um, there's E. coli that can produce morphine. Uh, those exist in labs. They're there. What was the uh, big one from a few months back? Like six? That was the morphine. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was told this year by somebody who should know that apparently there is a uh, uh, E. coli that produces cocaine that is finished, mm -hmm. ready to go. Um, they're just waiting for the right moment to like release it into the world. Um, so, you know, literally a 10 gallon carboy and some sugar and you could produce cocaine in your basement. Uh, these are technological kill shots to global prohibition. CIA um, is going to be pissed. Yeah, oh, wow. we also need to be thinking about what it means for these uh, indigenous communities that have been True. relying on this as their only cash crop for 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be thinking about that now so that we can be prepared for how we support those communities as drug distribution sort of becomes decentralized and delocalized from those communities. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think in the long run, I'm, I'm bullish on drugs for winning the drug war. Uh, I think in the long run, drugs are going to uh, end prohibition all on their own. And so even if there are sort of temporary interruptions within certain drug markets, they always seem to recover. Uh, you know, we've had years where it was really hard to get LSD in this country after Pickard was you know, arrested and the, the silo went down. Uh, there was a couple of years there where it was really, really difficult to get LSD in the United States. Uh, and we have now seen the complete sort of reversal of, of that where we've you know gone back to not quite the prices that existed before he went down, but you know, inflation's a thing. It was a long time ago. Uh, I think adjusted yes, it's for cheap enough. Probably within a bit yeah. of It's plenty cheap already. And um, plenty cheap. Yeah. On, on a dollar per hour of experience basis, it's like, you know, hard to, hard to argue for anything other than, than LSD <laughs> being sort of champion of that, that analysis. All right. Well, we are at time. Mitchell Gomez, Dan Safe. Thank you for joining us. Everybody should check out dancesafe.org and donate and, you know, get involved if you can. It's a great organization, saving lives, literally saving and, lives. And thanks for what you do as well, Joe. I really, uh, I love your, I love your stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much.